Welcome back to another episode of the Music History Project. Today is going to be part one of a two-part series focusing on American film composer and studio musician specializing in the synthesizer, Michael Boddicker. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Music History Project. We're your hosts. I'm Elizabeth Dale. And Dan Del Fiorentino. And Mike Mullins. All of our content comes from the Oral History Program, which is sponsored by NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants. And that is a program that is over 3,000 interviews and constantly growing. If you want to check out any of our content or any of the other interviews that aren't featured, please check out our website at www.nam.org slash library. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is really exciting. We have our uh, 2013 interview with uh, Michael Boddicker uh, queued up and ready to go. And um, we're really excited about sharing this very in- interesting story. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, Elizabeth has recently been able to review this interview and get it ready for today. Yeah, and just to let you guys know out there the format for today, Michael does an excellent job of telling his story without needing a lot of prompting from Dan during his original interview or commentary from us. So you're going to hear some huge chunks where we don't really break it up um, because he just tells a story so fluidly that it's not needed. So if you get annoyed by us, you get a break this week. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's a very compelling story. I mean, the reason that we picked Michael Boddicker is that he was there um, when so many great technologies were changing and being available in um, music. So as a result, we hear a lot of the birth of the synthesizer and how he utilized that in composing film work, uh, working with people like uh, Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones. So there's all kinds of uh, ins and outs of his career that uh, make it very compelling. He's also uh, been a very strong supporter of the oral history program. Uh, We were able to do our own interview with uh, Quincy Jones, thanks to Michael. So uh, he's been a great, uh, great help to us. So I thought this would be a great chance to honor his career and his contributions by uh, displaying in our podcast uh, his story. And Dan, if people want to go on and check out that interview with Quincy Jones, where do they go? Good question. Mike, where do they go? (laughs) I know the answer to this one. You go to www.nam, that's N-A-M-M, dot org slash library. I tried to cut you a break, Mike, and I tried to get Dan to do it. I know. I knew he was going to throw it to me, too. (laughs) (laughs) So in case you're not familiar with the name Michael Boddicker, um, there's a really good chance that you're probably familiar with a lot of his work. And I think Mike might have some of his credits pulled up so that way we can see that we all are familiar with him in one way or another. Yeah, well, um, just to name some artists that he's worked with, um, let's see, Michael Jackson being a big name. Um, Of course, he worked on the Thriller Project with uh, Jackson. That's true, yeah, and he did um, get some performance credits on that album as well. A lot of work with Quincy Jones, actually, before. I think that was his introduction to the Thriller Project was through Quincy Jones, who he worked with uh, in the 70s. So we're going to start Mike's Michael's segment today with uh, Dan's favorite question, and that is, did he have music in his home growing up? So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of music in my house when I was a kid. When uh, my mom was a music teacher, and my dad was a math scholar, instructor, coach, actually, who then uh, became a salesman for her. And together, they started the Boddicker School of Music, and uh, this was back in 19... Oh, it's it's like 1945. She started... uh, teaching 45. She started teaching in 45. And uh, we, at that time of the business in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, they uh, bought houses one next to another. So when I grew up, we had, um, I started playing at two or three, but, but, and I need to shut that off, don't I? Good to get that out of the way. Let's see. Uh, 
Yeah, so so you we taking lessons when? Well, that's two or three, but you know, <laughs> uh, just with like same with my children. You sit at a piano and you look at the note and you uh, uh, play the note and uh, you know make music fun in a game. And uh, so in in this household, we had a house. It had seven uninsulated studios in the basement. It had about a 30 by 45 foot band room, cinder block band room on the back of the house. And uh, next to the house was the, the building, the house, another home that we, or another house that we kept a, uh, the band instruments upstairs and all the amplifiers downstairs. On the corner was a house that had the storefront. And on the other side of our house was a, uh, a studio, a, ho- a house that had been converted to have a studio for guitars and drums. So four houses in a row, another storefront across town in a, uh, in a shopping center, another house converted in Iowa City, and another house in Waterloo. And so to say that I had was con- surrounded by music would be an understatement. I actually used to, I used to, in high school, I was working uh, uh, nightclubs and I would come home and I would swear that it might be my psychosis, but I would, I would hear uh, the accordion curriculum being played at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> down in that basement uh, after I got off of work in five hours. Um, so, so anyway, back to we. Had, so we, I grew up to, in that that music uh, environment, uh, surrounded by all different instruments. By the time I was ten years old, I had uh, already had in my possession a trombone. I had played tuba for a while. I played saxophone for a little bit. wasn't as adept at that as, as playing the brass instruments. Uh, um, I ended up keeping with trumpet, so I was playing accordion and trumpet and took up guitar, and that's where I fell in love, saw the Beatles on TV in the, uh, was that, 63 on Ed Sullivan? And and it wasn't, I have a lot of guys that I work with who, like, got it, they, they're very clearly there for the money, or they're very clear, they have, have one very famous studio pianist here who's, he's very clear, he got into it for the chicks, still in it for the chicks, 70 years old, still, I mean, sex is the driving motivator there. Uh, I got in it because I saw four guys making music together and working together shoulder to shoulder, creating and having what looked like a lot of fun. And, and that's what motivated me to pursue my career. And when I was 10, I saw the Beatles on TV and I said, that's what I want to do. But for that, for that team effort, not for the sex of the money. And, and uh, so uh, play, played, I think, my first uh, gig for money which was kind of an arbiter uh, uh, because uh, I played the opening of a, with my little combo, The Planets. Great guitar player, Dennis McMurrin, still gigging around. Just, they just sent me a video of him playing at a blues festival. He's phenomenal still. Uh, we played uh, live at the opening of a Piggly Wiggly in Mount Vernon, and we were supposed to make $3 for the whole combo, and they stiffed us. And, and should have been the arbiter, but you know, I kept we kept at it and and uh, started uh, uh, playing uh, uh, a lot more sock hops in those days. Things that, and that it, it was a great era for music because literally in the town I grew up in in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which wasn't that big. I think when when I was growing up, it was about one hundred twenty five thousand. And at the end, when uh, when you count all the surrounding areas that had now merged into the city, it got up to about a quarter of a million. But there was only a few million people in the state, you know. And and when uh, I was growing up, uh, there was a band on every corner, every corner. And that music store was hopping. We had 1,600 music students. And, and uh, although we had a lot of satellite studios, uh, so, so we had oh, <laughs> six station wagons in the back of our house all the time. My dad would load them up with guitars, accordions, and they would drive out to Tama. They would drive out to Tipton. They would drive out to uh, all, all the, the different surrounding areas that you could get to within an hour or so. And uh, they would set up at the Knights of uh, Columbus Hall, and they would have three different teachers 
teaching for four or five hours on a Tuesday night. And that was every Tuesday night in Vinton, Iowa. And then every Wednesday night somewhere else. And, and because he had the six cars going out, he had, you know, six operations going. My dad opened that store at 9 a.m. every day, and he was back in our house at about 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, and then on Saturdays, it was a nice night for the family because we uh, opened the store at 8 a.m., uh, the lesson started at 8, and we got to knock off about 6, so we got to have family dinner. And then Sunday was really a great day off because we only had to do recitals. We had, <laughs> you know, you, you drive into Chicago for the, uh, uh, for the Accordion Guild, or you drive into, uh, uh, we had the IATA in Des Moines where we took over Fort Des Moines Hotel. The, uh, it, it was just huge, the amount of accordion playing that went on, the amount of guitar playing. We once had a mass band, and I have a picture of that, uh, where our recitals for the Boddicker School of Music, we rented the 5,000 seat, uh, uh, conv- not convention center, um, it was, it was the, it's the, the destroyer, the, the aircraft carrier looking thing that was underwater in the floods in Iowa. They showed, yeah, I mean, it was like raised up 40 feet above, uh, above the river and, and the water overflowed on, into it. Uh, and, um, let me see if I can do this without making a fool of myself. It's the name, uh, it, it was, it was, it was the, 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 the big, Town, uh, uh, we we had. I first saw the animals there uh, when I was uh, like fifteen years old. Or? Yeah, like, uh, but not an arena. It was it was a convention center. Come on, they used to have the wrestling matches there. What did they call it, Mike? Anyway, so we used to rent this place out, five thousand seats, and uh, we had uh, about six hundred accordion players. We had about 400 guitar players and about 200 drummers on stage, live, at the same time in this one mass band. And I have great pictures of it. And, and there is three tiers. And so there's about two, 3,000 people on the floor. And there's, oh, it was the armory. It was the armory. So in the basement was, was uh, like, you know, tanks and, and, and all this other stuff, and, and then you go up, and it's this huge place where they used to have the wrestling events, uh, and, and they, then they'd have, uh, uh, before a convention center came in, all, all of that type of stuff was there, a huge stage, uh, really nice theater, and uh, then three tiers of people, and it's, in these pictures, it's packed, we had thousands, 5,000 people there for a recital. It, it was amazing. As in those days, kids, people would drive. They would drive an hour and a half in from the farm to get their kid a half-hour lesson then drive an hour and a half back. It was that Music was that important to their education. And that's one of the blessings that I had in growing up in Iowa. I'll leave a little nostalgic here. The, uh, uh, at that day, people understood the value of music education, what it did for your... Uh, self-confidence, uh, what it did for your ability to enjoy life. Uh, also, uh, I, you know, they didn't know this, but b- bottom line was uh, they were connecting right and left brain, just like you know, uh, uh, Mozart, uh, uh, the, all the stuff that we've done for uh, kids uh, with, with uh, the baby Mozart, and uh, I, I actually participated in a big study with that, putting and analyzing and working uh, with a guy at a college to, to see if this was real and all. And, and we, uh, uh, the bottom line is, yes, it helps. Music helps connect the right and the left brain. And uh, people understood the value of that. If not by science, they understood it intuitively, and they made sure that their kids got a music education. And we'd have, any given night, two 40-piece ensembles practicing in our band room, as well as all these other s- studios going. We'd have two 40-piece ensembles, you know, one at 7 o'clock and one at 8.15 or 8.30. And uh, we did that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and one on Friday night. It, it was incredible. Uh, we performed all. Of, I traveled all over the world. I, 
I performed in every state except for Hawaii by the time I was 16 years old. Uh, every summer, I got on uh, two buses with about 100 of my closest friends, and we w- spent two weeks traveling around the United States, uh, you know, setting up and playing uh, in a, a town square somewhere just so we could say we played in Wyoming. And, and, and we'd go around and do that, and uh, uh, the performance uh, experience that I got, the even just, and today, okay, I think this is really important for me. Just the act of getting out and setting up the equipment, unrolling the cables, plugging in the amplifiers, setting the stage, and then doing the performance, and then packing it all back up so it was ready to go the next performance when we unpacked, that was invaluable to what I do today. And and I still love that part. You know, it, it, when, when you get successful, as I've become successful, uh, people want to go, oh, no, you should have a cartage company doing that for you, and here you must get you an assistant to take care of this, and, you know, and, and the second engineer is going to set all that and do whatever. And, and it disassociates me from the grassroots of what I do. Uh, and, and I need... I find that I have a need to always stay connected with that, just like I have even in times when I'm producing a film. If I'm producing a film for a living, I still need to sit at the piano and run my hands on the keys just as part of my discipline to stay connected to who I am and what I'm bringing to the ballgame. Uh, uh, I, ha- I have to not just show up and sit like a, a, a brain on a stick, uh, on a chair somewhere, I'm, I, I need to be here going, okay, I'm a better filmmaker because I know what cable's being used on the speakers, what the, what the sample rates are, uh, what the speeds of the computers are, what the, the revs of software, and that came, that came from, okay, I know which cables go where. You know how are you know who what amplifiers can we lump together on one AC extension? All that. So, um, sorry, I get sidetracked. No, that's uh, fantastic. The uh, so 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 here I am. We're in Iowa. We've got this huge music store, um, and and my my dad is going. Would you you know be interested in coming in? My uh, I taught. You know, I taught on Tuesdays and Saturdays, which was no small feat if I had a rock band that was out playing in a high school on Friday night and we didn't get home until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning after wrapping up the equipment and driving three hours. And then I had to get up at 7 o'clock and drive out and, and teach guitar in a tumwa. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a real discipline. Uh, kind of let me know what later in life was going to be like when you're writing film scores and you're pushing a pencil for 20 hours a day and you just get, okay, I'm going to get that three or four hours that I have to get and then I'm back in the chair working. The uh, uh, Got that work ethic very solidly implanted. We um, were surrounded. We have all these bands going. Uh, you can play on the radio. You can get a battle of the bands going on the radio live uh, uh, every weekend, it, it was it was gr- a great time for performers, and 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 again the experiences were uh, just so thick and rich. So as you heard in that last segment, Michael talks a lot about uh, his kind of foundations in music and being exposed to music as a child and stuff like that. And we're going to hear him kind of switch gears a little bit. And one of you guys want to pick up and tell everyone what we're going to be talking about next? Well, it's really interesting to me uh, when conducting interviews with people so passionate about music making uh, is the little nuances of what gets their um, interest um, so profound. And I think for Michael, it had a lot to do with playing the organ and, of course, the electronics of it, the fact that he could manipulate sounds that he had never heard of before uh, was certainly very um, interesting to him. So how that led to his career as a performer playing the synthesizer and being very interested in everything electronic as it was coming out and being introduced. He was really at the right time uh, for all of that with that interest. And I mean, imagine his excitement when the Moog and the ARP and all of these great innovations uh, came out. He was one of the first to take the time to program them um, and really see what those instruments could do. So uh, this is kind of the most compelling part of the story as far as I'm concerned. So let's get going back to uh, Michael Boddicker's interview. 
Yeah, and real quick before we run out, I have a question for those of us not well versed in electronic music. Would you guys call the organ like the uh, foundation of electronic music? Like that's like kind of the the organ is what kicked off the idea to create like a synthesizer. I would say, I mean, this is just a guess, and Dan could probably elaborate more than me, but I would say that the organ. Um, pioneered the use of different sounds while still playing a keyboard instrument right like uh, structurally kind of the f- the first generation right like yeah the inspiration behind the synthesizer i guess yeah i could i could see an argument that would say that what do you think dan yeah i think well um historically the very first electronic instrument was the theremin and the theremin had oscillators that manipulated sounds that were very difficult for you to play because you had to wave your hands around these uh, metal bars. So the organ really was um, much more approachable, like the piano keyboard is there. So people are familiar with playing the piano can play this electronic instrument. And as Elizabeth pointed out, it did have a lot of different sounds um, and each of them had its own unique sound. So where I think Michael became very interested is the fact that different manufacturers like ARP and EMU and all of those sequential circuits later on, um, they all introduced these new keyboards, but each keyboard had different ranges, had different tones. And if you could manipulate them and program them like he could, um, then you could get even more out of it. So I do think the organ was really a very strong basis for all of this. Um, but a completely different instrument. You know, there are those who play the organ their entire career that never played synthesizer. Um, so I think the the bridge here that is very important for Michael's career is the fact that he was interested in electronics before playing the organ and very much interested in how those electronics were being utilized in the organ and seeing then some uh, comparative to synthesizers that were coming out like by Bob Moog and people like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was, I think that was excellent. I mean, it just, it seems like a kind of a natural transition to go from the organ to maybe electronic music, the synth and stuff, but I know they're not the same at the same time. So I appreciate that. Um, Does that make up for the two that I gave you earlier? Yeah, the okay. total two you gave me earlier. All right, we're finally ready to hear <laughs> <laughs> Michael talking about fa- falling in love with electronic music. I uh, showed up at a band rehearsal, was invited to play in a band, and I showed up and I had my guitar, and they said, the organ's over there, and I said, I'm I'm a guitar player, I'm a lead guitar player, and they said, we've already got two guitar players, if you want to make 25 bucks on Saturday night, you'll play the organ over there, and so I went over and I learned uh, these, their tunes on organ, and... uh, went from playing uh, Farfisa to playing a Vox Continental to buying, uh, with my college fund, I bought uh, a a Hammond B3 with Leslie, and uh, I would then uh, play four, five, six nights a week all the way through high school in jazz trios. I was the go-to. Anybody in town got sick, I was the guy who filled in. I got called to play weddings. Weddings. I mean, just, oh, you show up and, and they say, oh, play these songs for us. And there's no music. There's no nothing. You just show up and they have you doing it. And, and uh, the, again, it was a really thick, rich musical experience. And um, uh, then I uh, started uh, in high school. I had a songwriting teacher who Alan Kepke, lovely man, love Alan, what he did for my life. He actually had me take songs and write them out. So I had to write out the chord, uh, write out the bar chart, write out the chord changes, uh, write out the melody, write the lyrics underneath, and analyze them. And so I had to do that with pop songs. And that same guy had me listening to like Gabor Szabo. Uh, my sister at the time was having me get into West Montgomery and Jimmy Smith. Uh, she she was very heavily into uh, in in those days it was called R and B music and and uh, she started uh, pushing those records towards me. She she also uh, just to give my sister Michelle some credit here, uh, she uh, had me when I was a kid like Rubber Soul, Beatles Rubber Soul. We would listen and we wore out 
In one two-week Christmas vacation, we wore out rubber sole, we put it on our stereos, our Fisher stereo set, and we listened. She said, okay, I'm listening to the third harmony part. What are you listening to? And we would play the song through and say, okay, this time I'm listening to the second harmony part. What are you listening to? And I listened to the bass part. I listened to the tambourine part. I listened, and we would analyze. We would listen to all the parts. I have chills telling you this. It was just such a great time and a great learning experience of what makes up pop music. And... Uh, I'm always grateful to her for that. The, uh, and Alan Kepke then had me uh, listen uh, in, I was listening to all this different music, and while when I, one day I was in the library, back when we had libraries, back when you know I would go down and, and uh, get old blues masters, uh, our Hooli records, which were only available at the library and get those uh, blues masters and listen to them, I ran across Wendy, uh, Walter Carlos, at that time Walter, and uh, switched on Bach, and I just was blown away. And then I listened to Isao Tamida, and I went, oh, my goodness. At the same time, Alan had a substitute teacher come in who had a little EMS synthy in a suitcase. And he put it up, and he made an oboe sound, and he made a French horn sound, and he made a wind sound, and I went, <laughs> this is great. This is, this, is, this is great. I went out. I got a, a, a four-track TEC tape recorder and uh, a little... I had my preamp was a, a phono preamp. I plugged all my instruments into a phono preamp. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, before that, we'd been experimenting with uh, playing from one record or one tape recorder to another. So we had uh, uh, tape recorders to perf- take tape performances and whatnot. And uh, so I would, I would experiment with that. But uh, uh, then I got a four track. I, I learned about electronic music from Alan on paper. He had me go to see uh, my, my professor, my professor, uh, when I was in, I was still in high school, but I was going to college at the same time. So I had a light enough loaded high school that I could overlap my first year of, of college, which was, which was easy because I was taking a music degree. And it was like, you know, you come in knowing the curriculum already. I, I, uh, it, was, it, was, it was such a piece of cake uh, it was it was it was fun. It wasn't like I had to work. It was like I got to have fun for twelve hours a day before I went to play in the nightclubs at night. And uh, we had um, we had uh, Jerry Owen teaching me electronic music on paper. We didn't ha- have a synth- he didn't have a synthesizer at his composition department at Coe College and I didn't own a synthesizer yet and he taught me everything signal flow, what the functions of oscillators, the different waveforms, what the harmonic makeup was, uh, what uh, a, a voltage controlled filter did, what the amplifiers do, what the envelope generators do, what ring modulators do, all, sequencers, all that taught me on paper for six months before I ever got my hands on a synthesizer. And I went to NAM show that year, went to the NAM show, very clearly can remember, and Roger Powell, and I don't know if you know who Roger Powell, Roger Powell was demonstrating the uh, ARP Odyssey, and Roger Powell went on not only to make his own albums, which were phenomenal, Cosmic Furnace is still one of my favorite electronic music records ever, he went on to work with Todd Rundgren, do all all that synthesizer work. He's a phenomenal musician, phenomenal composer, and I believe right now he's working at HP. He he uh, he's a computer geek, you know. Uh, but he's he a great musician. And when I showed the Amiga computer at, I, I opened the the Amiga. Uh, for Commodore at uh, Lincoln Center in New York, Andy Warhol did the um, Andy Warhol did the graphics and the visual, and I did the audio and music. I asked Roger Powell to play synthesizer with me on stage, so I had Tom Scott playing sax, Roger Powell playing synthesizer, and I played synthesizer. And uh, yeah, way before uh, uh, 
unlimited, uh, you know, the UPS unlimited power supply, so that you had uh, uninterruptible power supply. So when when things went down, you you just lost. You had to reboot from scratch. Uh, but but it was uh, uh, Roger Powell was uh, back to the Odyssey. He was playing, demonstrating an Odyssey, and he was so kind, and he showed me. Uh, all the stuff that I could do with it, and I completely fell in love. Uh, I uh, eventually ended up in my first synthesizer, as, as close as my friendship was with Bob Moog, you know, who used to come and stay in our home. So he's a very sweet friend and, and, and dear, dear man. We, um, I, my first synthesizer was an ARP, and uh, I had an ARP soloist and an ARP 2600. And... Uh, that ARP 2600, which I studied in college, along with the modular Moog, along with still in those days I was studying music concrete. So we were still taking and chopping together pieces of tape and turning them backwards and ring modulating them and making different pieces of music. Um, we, uh, uh, I studied for a year, I studied in a class, Roger Powell's they used as the syllabus for the class was uh, Roger Powell's ARP 2600 Owner's Manual, which is still today, if you haven't read it, it's brilliant. It lays music out so simply. It connects all the dots. It, it, there, you, you, when you get done with that book, you have no doubt that you understand the flow from left to right. And, and that's still, with kids that I see today, one of the problems is they don't really, oh, if I do, I know that if I connect this to this, that, that, that I'm okay. But they don't understand why they're connecting it. And, and, and it, it, I think that that is as important a part of my life as having to wrap and plug in amplifier cables. You know, that, you know, no, just knowing signal flow, workflow. Um, so here, here now, uh, at this point, my parents are going, are you going to be part of the music store? And we were right at that era. It was, it was you know, uh, I think uh, Herschel Blankenship was out here starting uh, music stores here where uh, there were, uh, you know, kind of more like superstores. And I was trying to get my dad to go, okay, here, if we organize the store this way, you know, with aisles, not, not like a mom and pop shop with everything hanging on the wall, uh, but, but uh, you know, where we get aisles and we get uh, uh, multiples of pieces stacked up, you know, we could do bigger business and stuff. And, and there was some blowback on that, where my dad was more interested in maintaining the the way of business that he had, he'd been very successful at it. 1,600 students every week, that's a huge thing. You know, uh, traveling, being invited to play all over the world with the accordion orchestras, uh, that, was, that was a huge thing. And they were very successful and happily successful at it. And uh, I, I kind of, um, I wanted... Uh, to be on a larger scale, and uh, the the I, I got to tell you, it, even in that, my there is a certain grounding that goes on there where you go, hey, if if it works, don't fix it. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's going to be a uh, he, this is something where he found his niche. Where he was, he was comfortable. He uh, he got to uh, be surrounded by people who he loved. He, my dad, was a master of remembering people's names. He knew people's family histories, all the outlying er- areas, who owned what farm where, and 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 he that was part of his mind. He used to actually one of the things that my dad did for me was uh, he had me uh, learn accounting with him, and and uh, he would go, okay, Mike, here, uh, take and add up, here's the day's receivables, add them up on the adding machine, the old crank handle adding machine at that day, and, and i add them all up, and I'd read out the numbers live to him as I did it. And at the end, uh, uh, he would go, it's $6,423.17. And he'd be sitting across the room while I'm shouting out these numbers to him. And, and, and I'd say, yeah, exactly. Exactly. He, w- he was just a brilliant mathematician, and, and he used his brain, and the way he had his business running used his brain. And it used his salesmanship abilities. That, that was a key. For me to see my dad in a store with somebody who come in the door, 
because he had a really, he wanted to treat all people the same. Okay? If you came in the door and you were rich or you came in the door and you were not rich and your kid needed a musical instrument, he still was one of those guys who sold at retail. He didn't discount. He didn't get everybody, you know, occasionally a professional musician would come in and he would give him a 10% discount. But most of the time, everybody paid retail. And, and techniques within that of how do, you, how do you do what's best for the people a brand new SG, kid comes in, what the perfect instrument for that guy is an SG, but I can't sell to him at a discount and he can't afford that. Son, take this in the back room and put some fingerprints on it. And I take it in the back room and I pick a little bit on the pick guard and I put my fingers on it, bring it back out, it's a used instrument. He's selling that kid a new instrument as used so that he can maintain that I treat everybody fairly. You know, his salesmanship skills were incredible. He, uh, and he cared the most about the kids, the students. My dad was not a great musician, but he knew theory enough that if a teacher didn't show up, you know, somebody got sick at the last minute or whatever, he could sit down in a lesson for a half hour and give that kid, not, maybe not the lesson that he would have gotten with his guitar teacher, but certainly enough about math and theory and how that all works together. And, and, and it was great to watch because that was his driving force was how do I improve the lives of the children that are coming up? And I have to, I have to uh, also go to, it wasn't just about children. It was about children who were 60 and 70 years old who had been told by an older sibling, you can't sing, don't sing. You know, don't, sh- shut up, don't sing. And, and those people would come in to our store later in life, and my mom specialized in that, of going with people who were 60 and 70 years old and now had time and wa- always wanted to play but were told they had no ability, and she would show them that they had ability. And, and uh, so whether they were kids of two or, or, or slightly older or whether they were kids of 70, she was teaching them and my dad was teaching them music and caring about music in their lives and what could be made to make their lives better. Uh, so, um, so we had this store and then I started working, playing music and falling in love with electronic music and um, I was writing songs. And uh, I think in my last year of college, I wrote and copyrighted 70 songs. Essentially, we'd go to college and we'd study uh, piston harmony. And I'd take that lesson from the day and I'd come back and I would uh, write a song around that lesson. And I'd copy it out. I'd put my money in. And I think in that day, it was like $7.50 or something to copyright a song. And I'd put it in the envelope and I'd send it off. It was part of my discipline every day to knock out a song. And uh, so uh, I was writing a lot of material and uh, playing a lot of different kinds of music and uh, noticing that all the records that came in uh, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, were all made in Hollywood. And I started making yearly visits to Hollywood. So I'd come out. Um, in that day, the Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Inn circuit, Marriott's and Hollywood Inn's, uh, would uh, Marriott and Holiday Inns uh, had circuits and you'd be in a band and you'd drive 500 miles play another one, 500 miles play another one and you'd just make this loop so that once a year you were coming back through the same place. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I would go to those places and meet the musicians. They were all from Hollywood. And uh, so I, you know, I, I was very good about... Uh, keeping uh, a notepad with all the names and numbers. And people let me sleep on their sofas out here. And uh, so I, w- I would fly out and stay for two weeks and, and audition and I'd go to the Guitar Center. At that time, the Musicians Union had a board that had all the listings of open gigs. Uh, Guitar Center was just starting up very, so the one on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, you uh, have... Um, I would go to the back, to the, the bulletin board, and people were auditioning different people, and I'd go audition. Mm-hmm. Then I'd go back home, and I'd 
go back to school, go back to playing in my nightclubs and whatever. I think you're totally right, Dan, with that segment that you can just hear Michael's passion in his voice. Um, And it's a really compelling segment. You can really feel his growth in the industry and how he determined at a pretty young age that this is what he's going to do for the rest of his life. Um, And we're going to move on to him talking about the NAMM show, our favorite time of the year. Absolutely. And he has so many great, unique experiences with all of his connections, all the uh, companies he's worked with, all the people he's met. Uh, Like so many of us, going to the NAMM show is like a family reunion. Um, So he had a lot of opportunities to to really get in and understand some of these instruments before they were even being launched. One thing I found captivating about Michael's story that we hear kind of frequently throughout the collection when people reflect on their time at the NAMM show is that they come from a musical home where their parents owned a shop or were involved in the music products industry. They go as a kid, they go under kind of the foot of their parents, and then they transition into their own identity at the NAMM show. And we're so lucky because we have someone here that did the same thing. That's right. Well, I, oh, he's across the table from oh, me. Oh, that's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Is that weird? Is that transition weird? Like going as like a guest of your parent, essentially, or under your parent's shop? And then... No, not really. I think it adds a different element to the music industry as a whole. It makes it a lot more um, nostalgic. It makes it seem more like a family thing. Because um, I've been around products in the music industry my whole life. I mean, I was pretty much born into a music store. Um, so the, the natural progression of it, um, from, you know, being around the store, just hanging around it as a kid and then working in it and then moving on to work, um, here at NAM, it just, it, it's something that's always with you. And I think it, it, um, musicians and, um, people that get high up in the industry that start out at a family music store, um, have a better perspective on the industry as a whole. Where is your family shop, by the way? My dad's music store is in Woburn, Massachusetts. It is Performance Music Center. And they just celebrated 30 years in business last year. And I hope your dad gets something for that, some sort of recognition or something. Yeah, we'll we'll see. (laughs) We should work on that. And I have a trivia question for Elizabeth. Michael Boddicker coming from a music store. Can you name any other famous musicians whose parents owned a music store? Um, no. You met him? Oh, uh, Jim Horn. No. Oh, dang. <laughs> I like how you that's... Had, uh, you had Swedish pancakes <laughs> with him. Oh, oh yeah. My best buddy, Rick Nielsen. That's right, from Cheap Oh, Trick. my gosh. I totally forgot Grew about Rick. up in the music store. He's... Shout out to Rick. I hope you're listening right now. <laughs> I just assume every answer is Jim Horn. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you're pretty close. <laughs> Okay, so let's hear Michael Boddicker talking about his experiences at the NAMM show. I meant to tie this together with the NAMM show because this whole time I'm going to the summer NAMM show in Chicago, which was phenomenal. Which, Chicago is still probably my favorite city in the United States. Chicago is phenomenal. In fact, I've lost one of my daughters to Chicago. She went to the University of Chicago, and she's never coming home. She's get, getting married there. She's having children there. She's got her career going already there. It, it's, uh, Chicago is now another big part of my life, but we used to go there back when the NAM show was between the Palmer House and the Conrad Hilton. They used to take it over, and people still smoke cigarettes, so I remember these... It, I remember these big hallways filled with blue smoke and Fender would have four rooms in a row and Gibson would have four rooms in a row. And, and you know, they were just stacked floor by floor by floor, taken over by the NAMM show. That's before we moved to the McCormick place. And, um, but, but, so that was the summer and it was hot and smoky and I saw people play. I saw Dave Brubeck Dave Brubeck with uh, 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 Jerry Mulligan playing uh, saxophone. Paul Desmond, I saw him playing saxophone with him as well. Uh, 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 Joe Morello playing. I saw Joe Morello play five times live at the NAMM show. I saw, uh, I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. Uh, uh, I saw um, Phil Upchurch play guitar. Uh, I saw 
uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill Palmer and Bill Hughes, I saw perform there regularly, and they were spectacular. Uh, the duo accordion players, just spectacular musicians. Uh, Bill went on to be a, uh, a doctor of music at uh, a University in Houston, and and wrote some books. He's he's spectacular. But that Palmer Hughes method, Palmer Hughes method was fabulous. Uh, I saw saw them at the NAMM show. Um, uh, Don Lewis playing organ. Uh, uh, oh my goodness, Don Lewis playing organ, just. I'm just going. How does he? How does he keep all those appendages going so independently and sing and smile and look like he's having a good time? You know, it was four or five musicians playing at once. And uh, oh my goodness, I saw the Buckinghams play live uh, when they had a hit. When they had uh, "Mercy, Mercy, Mercy" on the radio, they played it live on stage at the Nam Show. Uh, oh, it was great. It was, it was it was a great time, and um, uh, the the Nam show for me there were ed, uh, the what I guess we call Nam University now, right? The educational things, uh, which which for me it's a problem because I, it's there's there's only about three and three quarter days to get the whole Nam show in, and I can't do it. I mean, I have a method where I, I start down each aisle and I try to go like that and I try not to get distracted by people who live two miles away from me that want to visit for me for an hour down in, in Anaheim. But, but I, I try to hit every booth every year and it's, it's almost impossible to do that uh, and not be rude to people. And, uh, and then it's impossible to take in the... the to be able to go and do the NAM University stuff at the same time, but I got to tell you, when I was a kid and I went to those things, and uh, they'd have music theory, and 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 uh, they would have, uh, um, I don't want to say salesmanship classes, but there are salesmanship classes, and I think that that obviously what we do in the music industry in life period is so much salesmanship, you know that that that's another big part of. This story, my story, my Nam story, my musical story is is being around great salesmen, being around the 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 people who were the uh, reps for the companies, uh, uh, Bill Lacombe for Sonar Drums, who used to spend you know s- several weekends at our home when he'd visit through, uh, you know Myron Florin would come through on his concert circuit, stay at our home. Uh, uh, other other uh, reps that would come through, and uh, I got to see, you know, how they conducted themselves, uh, how they, in difficult situations, were able to make the best of them, how they were able to convert a no into a yes, uh, all, all of that, and it's really just basic life tools. How do you answer the phone? You know, a lot of people don't have that anymore. You know, we had classes that that at, at NAM that would you know were teaching us marketing, basic basic marketing, uh, basic personal skills. Uh, um, and I don't mean manipulation. I mean how do I do the best for that other human being? The, the real reason. You know, how do, how do I give for them what I'd like for myself? And um, so the NAM experience was really rich, and because it was in Chicago, and because there were, and that day, the, the development of discos, uh, it was phenomenal. The night parties, uh, the, the music that we'd see, the concerts we saw, the people that, that demonstrated at NAM, the, the, the parties in the evening, it was a phenomenal experience. And, and I don't know that they do this anymore, but we used to attend regularly as a family uh, uh, like formal dinners that were like a NAM dinner, and they'd have somebody speak and they'd have somebody perform, and it was uh, 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 more a networking event, but it was formal. And it was really sweet, really nice in a, in a fancy ballroom. Uh, uh, everybody dressed up, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Dave Rubeck pay, playing uh, and and uh, a keynote speaker, and and it was it was fancy. It was it was really nice. 
uh, those were those were really good days. Uh, and um, one of the things that as I progressed, one of the things that always brought me back home was meeting my parents at NAMM show. You know? So I'm out on the road working, and I would still always take off that four days to go back and hit the NAMM show. And uh, we, we had a period of time where we always hit the, the summer and the winter. You know, there was a point where Chicago was dying out, and uh, I think it was one of my saddest parts, my saddest days, when I went, I went to the NAMM show at the McCormick Center, the last one at the McCormick Center, and I hit every booth in the NAMM show in less than two and a half hours. And I, 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 I then, then they kicked it where the winter NAMM show at Anaheim was the one to be at. And, you know, there's been no looking back. That's a phenomenal event. It's, 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 to me, to me, I'll put my pitch into the NAMM people right now, it needs to not be from Thursday to Sunday. It needs to be more like a music mess up from Wednesday to Monday or from Monday to Sunday because it's so big now that it's, it's impossible to take in the entire event and still spend quality time with people. And if you want to go and do seminars at the same time, it's, it's harder uh, because you have to trade off. Okay, I'm going to give up seeing Hall E, which is, which is great. I mean, every year, okay, at the NAMM show, every year I show up, I, I get there uh, between 7.30 and 8 a.m. so I can have breakfast, and usually at that NAMM breakfast, or I'll meet somebody uh, business-wise at uh, the Hilton, and I'll have breakfast there, and then I'll be at Hall E at 9.30, because to me, Hall E with the new guys, the little guys, showing their little inventions, like somebody found a new type of drumstick to hit a cymbal with that makes a different noise. I mean, that's all in Hall E. All the, the, the uh, up-and-coming inventors are down in Hall, Hall E. And, and I think that's with my inventions, uh, and I didn't talk about that yet. You know, I have a couple patents and uh, patents pending, and uh, uh, I have patents applied for, <laughs> I should say, and uh, 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 my inventions. A lot of that is is spurred from my experience at Nam Show, uh, where you go down and you see just a guy with an idea and five thousand bucks to rent a booth, and he's down there showing it and talking and giving. You know, that's that's another part of my Nam Show experience is that people aren't going okay. Uh, that information is valuable. Uh, how much are you going to pay me my hourly fee? To know? People are there to sell you their ideas. People are there to give and share and interface. And it's so strong. The, the, the charge that I get from going to a NAM show creatively lasts me for at least a year. You know, the, the, the people that I meet, uh, the relationships that I have, um, with creative individuals, with people like Paul De Benedictus, who you watch, whoa, how does he market that? You know, how's, how's he, oh, I see, you seed this area, you seed this area, and all of a sudden it grows up into this, where there's a thousand pieces for every one seed that you made. You know, it's, it's amazing to watch people directly related at NAM, uh, how, how they uh, plant success how they create success, how they create, they look for a need that people have and they fulfill it and they joyfully uh, earn a living doing it as well. Um, Because we don't want to fool ourselves. Bottom line is that we, we have to make money to survive. And, and it's not the core driving, uh, uh, factor at the NAM shows. For, for me, that's not the feeling I get. The feeling that I get, the core driving factor at the NAM show, is the love of music, the spread of music to people, 
for people, for, for the good of the person who's receiving the music, and uh, we're just fulfilling the service at, in, as music merchandisers uh, uh, of, of actually uh, getting them product that they can enrich their lives with. And uh, in there, we're kind of like doctors. You know, and the good kind of doctor, the doctor who actually spends the time to care about the patient and uh, treat the whole person. It, it's it's uh, the the Hall E experience is what uh, I think um, the the entire. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to reframe that. I'm going to uh, please forgive me. Uh, I'm going to reframe frame that the. The, the Hall E experience and the creative experience, the good sharing of, look what I can do. Hey, check out what I did with this technology. Yeah, they did. They meant it to do this, this, and this, but wow, look what I did. Look what I was able to turn it into. I mean, it's, it still, still lights me up all day, all day. In fact, uh, uh, I spent last night with Eric Smith, who is the founder and president of Oralex, and about 69 other eggheads who are inventors and manufacturers, uh, Aspen Pittman from Groove Tubes, uh, Skipper Wise from Blue, uh, Wes Dooley at AEA, uh, all these people together in a room uh, doing what we do at the NAM show every year, and that's sharing and giving ideas and developing things uh, uh, and, and, and taking joy in them. Not, not just going, okay, bottom line, money. How are we going to make it? Essential part of this whole equation, but not, not the big part. The big part is how do we take and do something joyful that's good for people with what we've got. And... and um, so uh, we are here at the NAM show. We've now gone to all the way out of McCormick Place, and we saw what happened in Nashville. Uh, and, and I guess we still have the summer in uh, Nashville between Austin and uh, the summer NAM between Nashville and Austin. But the big deal, right, our, our Anaheim that tried to be at the L.A. Convention Center, you have to travel too much in the L.A. Convention Center, two long hallways to join the, the huge space that we, we have for NAM, right? The uh, uh, Anaheim Convention Center works much better for that. And, um, and I think it also keeps a lot of the looky-loos out. Although I, I personally believe that it's essential that you have professionals involved, you know? I think it's, it, you know... You don't have to have kids off the street wandering in, but you have to, you know, that, that uh, 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 Steve Vai uh, comes by and uh, plays your guitar at your booth. I mean, he's not a NAM re- retailer, but he's an essential part of our industry uh, and for the manufacturer to interface directly with him at the NAM show, I think is a very important part. Um, but you keep the 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 looky loos out by going to Anaheim, and you have a uh, you have uh, uh, still the professionals that will take the time to go down and make it part of their routine to see w- what people are creating, how people are taking what tubes are left being manufactured, and and creating great guitar amplifiers that replicate the guitar amplifiers that sounded great in the 50s that we can't get the parts for anymore. So that's going to wrap up part one of our interview with Michael Boddicker. Be sure to stick around uh, in two weeks. We'll come out with the conclusion to this interview. Um, Also, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening uh, just to let us know how you enjoy the podcast. Um, We always enjoy seeing that feedback. See you in two weeks.